Joe Snyder today. He is, um, I don't know if people have noticed this on her uh, website at all, is Chief Security Something or Other at Mozilla Corporation. That's really the, the title. Um, and as you know, uh, Mozilla is the, kind of the producer, the manager, the facilitator, really, right, of the Firefox browser. Um, and what that really means, I think, is that uh, Window is the leader of something like 20,000 independent um, programmers uh, helping to produce the uh, Firefox browser, which is kind of an amazing um, kind of entity to lead in general. Prior to joining Mozilla, um, Window was the, a founder of the Matasano Security Services Company in New York. She was also a senior security strategist at Microsoft in the security engineering and communications organization there. Um, prior to that, she was director of security architecture at At Stake and um, was also a software engineer for five years uh, at Accent, Accent Technologies that was uh, eventually purchased by Symantec. Uh, so lots of technical security experience. Um, and she's going to talk to us today, I think, about security a little more broadly. Finally, she's just the, also the co-author of a, of a text that people here might be familiar with, which is Threat Modeling, a Manual for Security Architecture Analysis in Software. So join me in welcoming you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, you got a little bit of background here, but I, I am going to... Uh, tell you a little bit more about who I am and uh, what, what Mozilla is because the examples that I'm using for our security process um, is, uh, are, are primarily coming from Mozilla, although I did work at Microsoft and um, as a consultant, so I, I've, I've definitely seen a lot of different environments, but most of the examples I'm talking about today are, are, uh, are coming from the Firefox uh, development environment. And um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about a security process at Mozilla, talk about how we measure success and um, some of the challenges that we're having, one of those in particular are security UI, and uh, I think that's actually a really inter interesting space, and a space that uh, Firefox is really innovating, and, um, but it, the, the stuff that we're, we're dealing with is, is, it kind of reflects what the, the industry is, is dealing with as, as, a, a, as a whole, trying to uh, communicate information to users, but um, make it very specific. And then um, lastly, kind of just you know, talking about how, how we all, as individuals, influence the, uh, the software industry. So, um, so senior security, or wait, what am I? I am the chief security something or other at Mozilla, and uh, that just essentially means I, 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 I head up security, and uh, that cr in includes a bunch of different categories like security stra strategy, engineering, response, communication, and so on. Um, but uh, there are a lot of moving parts, and I'm a, a single contributor within a, uh, a large network of contributors, both people who work for Mozilla and people who volunteer, people who um, are part of the Mozilla security community as, as um, uh, a representative from another vendor. So um, there's, there are a lot, of, a, a lot of people who contribute to making uh, Firefox secure. I was at Microsoft um, uh, previously, and I, I did spend a lot of time with product teams trying to help Microsoft make those products more secure. And I was there from, I started there in 2002, so that was kind of a, a painful time for Microsoft in terms of what was going on in security. So it was a transitional period. I owned security sign-off on Windows XPSP2, which was the first operating system they released where security was a primary focus, and, um, and also Windows Server 2003. Um, and, uh, and as was mentioned, I, I, I developed a lot of methodolo methodologies for application analysis at, at stake, one of which became known as threat modeling, um, which is now required uh, as part of the, uh, uh, the software development lifecycle for any product at Microsoft before it ships. So about Mozilla. Mozilla, I mean, I, I don't assume that you guys all are all familiar with Mozilla, but how many of you are familiar with Firefox? All right, awesome. Okay, so Firefox is uh, a single product. Mozilla is actually a community. It's a, it's a corporation, it's a foundation. It's the, the corporation's wholly owned by the foundation. So it's a nonprofit. Um, it's a, the, the corporation is a corporation, but it acts like a nonprofit because the only shareholder is the nonprofit. Uh, but Mozilla is more than just the corporation or the foundation. There's a community of people out there, and that's really what I'm going to talk to you about today. Because this is uh, not intended to be a vendor pitch by any stretch. This is a community uh, organization, and this, the, the way that we operate is based on public good, trying to do something that, that uh, improves the web for users and that um, uh, uh, implements best practices and also gives back to the community so that our learnings are available uh, beyond the Mozilla, uh, Mozilla projects. So it is an open source project and there are 200 million users and 
uh, thousands and thousands of contributors uh, at all different levels. You can contribute by writing source code, you can contribute by being a tester, you can contribute by being an evangelist, and there, there are people on, on college campuses who uh, you know, just give people a switch over to Firefox, and people who write add-ons, which um, in, enable additional functionality within, uh, in addition to what, what's available in the browser. So there's lots of ways to be part of the Mozilla community. Um, so when I talk about the Mozilla community, I'm referring to all of these, all of these people. So um, to give you an idea of, of, of what the uh, community looks like, if this is me, um, this might be the the the, the, uh, the platform development team. So I'm on I'm on I'm on um, engineering. The platform development team is about 40. The, uh, development overall is maybe closer to 80 at this point. Um, daily contributors, yeah, we're getting closer to maybe like like 200 or 150 somewhere in there. Um, these are people who who, who who are checking in code on a daily basis. Um, or, or, or writing to, uh, to, uh, to comments in the, the bug tracking database. Um, contributors overall, there are probably about 1,000 for any, any major release of, of Firefox. And um, for nightly testers, these are people who every night download the, bill, the build and run it on their machines and then report back if they see problems. So on any given night, you'll have 20,000. But also together, there's, there's many more than that. But on any given night, you'll have 20,000 different downloads of the browser. And that contributes greatly to our security efforts. And I'll come back to that later. Um, there are about 100,000 beta testers when we release a beta. Actually, we actually had a million beta testers for our, our, our last beta, which was unbelievable. But in general, it's, it's, it's much smaller than this. So for like a smaller release, we'll get like a couple hundred thousand. But there are about 200 million users. And so this, uh, this community is, um, you know, when people ask like, what is, how big is Mozilla? It's kind of hard to answer that question because it's like, well, where do you, where do you draw these lines? All these people are contributing to the success of Firefox and making um, that product available. Um, we are about 20% of the uh, internet at this point, and in some places like Finland and Indonesia, we're over 50%. Um, and uh, supposedly uh, aliens run Firefox, but we don't have numbers available for that. Um, so the way it all works is that anyone can propose a change, and I made a suggestion earlier today that someone over there should um, propose a change, and, and if, if they want to see that, they can create, they can open a bug, and create, uh, you know, repo, uh, repo steps to identify what the problem is, and you know, solve the problem, suggest some code, and and and, and volunteer it for. Um, uh, inclusion into the, into the overall product if they want to see that sort of thing happen. Um, anyone can comment for a proposal for change. That means like anyone here, you guys, all you have to do is sign up for a, an account and you can say, that's a dumb idea. Or you can say, no, do it this way. Or you can say, yeah, I, I think this would work really well and if you consider this other information, this, this research paper that I'm working on that you might not have looked at, you know, that might be relevant for what you're doing. And anyone can comment. Um, anyone can submit a change as I, as I, as I just suggested here. But uh, not everyone can approve a change. So this is, this is the, the gate mechanism, right? Like that we have this, this huge community and lots of people who are suggesting what we can do in terms of um, not just security, but like any kind of change. But in order to be able to get that change into the code base, it has to be approved by peer reviewers and by the, the component owner. And the component owner is not necessarily employed by Mozilla. It's just the person who has been um, like organically <laughs> selected. Um, either they were the one who has been doing it for years and years, or they uh, demonstrated some particular initiative. Um, but those are the people who approve changes. And the process for that is self-selecting, that uh, in order to get check-in privileges, you have to be nominated by someone else. You have to get approval by, uh, you have to be seconded. And um, it, it ends up being actually a pretty effective mechanism. So it's a community of people who are, who are um, working very closely together. So this all ties into the open approach to, sec to, to security. And I think um, the, the reason I want to talk to you guys about this, and that's why I have to give you all the background on, on how Mozilla works, is because, um, and I've had this conversation with a couple of different people already today, is that um, there are a couple of different ways of doing business and security. And the general way that people have done it in the past is to keep all that information private and not share anything and be very afraid that if this information is going to get out, it's going to hurt your users or it's going to make you look bad as a corporate or as, a, as an organization or a corporation. And uh, so you should keep it all as close to the chest as possible. But there are other ways to do business and Mozilla has demonstrated that you can be open, um, not just with your source code, but also with things that are generally secret like security issues, like what are you doing in terms of security? How are you going to implement the security feature? What are the features coming up? You know, from, from, you know, not even from a security perspective, but just in general as a competitive, um, as a, as a competitive feature. Uh, you know what are you doing, and 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 um, and you can make this information available. And what Mozilla has uh, has has identified is that it's it's core to how we do business. It's 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 something that we're um, we're always going to do because it's uh, we, we think it's critical. But we're also able to demonstrate that you know other organizations can be more open, especially about security issues. And that's one of the things that I'm really passionate about is that we can be more open when it comes to security. We can um, and yes, there's a cost. You will probably get negative PR for it. Um, and you might get criticized that you're not doing enough or you're not doing the right things. But you also get feedback that, hey, you're not doing enough, you're not doing the right things. You can incorporate that into what you're doing and change what you're doing and improve what you're doing. 
chance to tell people, we get a chance to tell people, this is what we're thinking about doing. And before we implement it, we get feedback from our, our, our community that, uh, hey, what you're doing, maybe that's not the best idea. You could do it a different way. And if we get that feedback, the change can be as simple as you know, wiping off the whiteboard and starting again or drawing it a little bit differently, which is a much smaller impact in, 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 into the development schedule or you know, uh, to our, 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 our resources than it would be to have that implemented and find out down the road once it's deployed that this isn't, a, um, this isn't what the users need, this isn't um, the right fix, this isn't um, a, a good idea, and then we have to, change it to ship a security update for it. So there are lots of reasons that we want to be uh, transparent and um, core to these are being able to get support for testing and security review from the community. So I go out to the security research community uh, on a regular basis and I say, you know, hey guys, I want you to get engaged. And when I say guys, I mean that in a gender neutral way. I want you guys to get engaged. I want you to, to, to go away, to go bang on, on Firefox. And if you find vulnerabilities, let us know about it because we want to fix it. And that's something that most vendors are kind of scared to do because it is, it is making yourself a target. But on the other hand, it's also saying, you know, like, hey, we want your help and we will listen to you and we will incorporate your feedback. A lot of these security researchers, they really feel like the reason that they invest time doing this work is because they want things to be better. Um, they don't all have this Robin Hood approach to it and some of them are doing it for attention for sure, but so are we all about everything that we do, right? Um, but it doesn't matter because the bottom line is that once we know about the issue, we get it fixed. It doesn't matter what your motivations were for sharing it with us. It doesn't even matter how you shared it with us. Although it does to some extent. There's, there are better ways and worse ways, right? But the bottom line is once we know about it, we can fix it. So we'd rather know about it than not. So that means if, uh, if encouraging people means that we'll get more, more feedback, then I'll go out there and ask people to, 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 to bang away at Firefox, identify vulnerabilities, let us know about it. The code and developer documentation is available to anyone, which means that you don't have to try and figure out how something works in order to do security analysis on this. When you're doing um, penetration testing or security analysis, oftentimes you spend a lot of time in reconnaissance trying to reverse engineer a protocol um, that's proprietary or a file format or you, know, you name it. You can spend a lot of time in reconnaissance and a very small amount of time in analysis. But if you had everything laid out for you, if the developer documentation from that vendor were available to you and the source code were available to you, you could spend all your time in analysis. And that is a much better return on your investment than uh, as, a, as a security uh, researcher than uh, trying to reverse engineer all these different protocols, just trying to understand how something works. And obscurity doesn't protect you from anything. So uh, keeping that information private in the hopes that like, if no one knows how it works, then nobody will find vulnerabilities with it. That doesn't work. You're able to find vulnerabilities with you know, you know, the same tools that uh, attackers use. Attackers have debuggers. <laughs> they will figure out how things work. It's not, this is not like magic technology. They will figure it out. So um, one of the things that I really try to promote is that obscurity is not, not helping you. Ke keeping your, um, Keeping uh, the, the, the way that this component functions secret isn't protecting you in, a, in any real security perspective. It's going to be, if someone, wa if someone wants to look at it and find vulnerabilities in it, this is not going to be much of an obstacle to them. So um, I think most importantly for me is that when we say something is, uh, you know, we have confidence in the security of some component, external parties can check our work. We don't, you don't have to take our word for it. You can validate it yourself. Um, Academic environments can evaluate it for us. Third-party uh, vendors use it to test their tools with. You know, if someone writes a source code analysis tool and they want to demonstrate that their tool is effective, they can run it against our code base and use it to demonstrate that their tool is effective. So we get a lot of support from places that you wouldn't necessarily expect, and we get it for free because it's useful to the person who is who's doing it as well. Um, People, who, people can participate in our meetings. If you want to call into our design meetings, you absolutely can. Microsoft does. We sometimes hear um, some of the things that we say in meetings come back through other channels, so that's kind of cool. Um, we, actually, we actually have a very good relationship with Microsoft. I used to work at Microsoft, so I, I, I have an especially affectionate relationship um, with the IE team. Um, but uh, you know, we think it's really important, for, for especially for browser vendors, to collaborate because what we're trying to do from a security perspective is protect everybody online. And so there's such um, tremendous points of um, of, uh, of, of, of crossover in terms of like value that, that you know, if we're not sharing, if we're not talking, then we're doing a disservice to both of our users. So um, I really uh, think that that's important. And for the most part, we, we, we really do get along, even despite what it says in the press. Sometimes you might see things that look like we're at odds in the press. Um, that sells newspapers or sells, it gets eyeballs on these uh, stories, but it's not always the case. For the most part, we all get along, we're professionals, and we're all talking about the, 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 the technology, even if we disagree about the details of how to implement things. And then one of the lessons I want to talk about here is uh, real-time real updates on vulnerabilities is that um, not talking about an issue uh, when you know something about it is, n it, doesn't, it, doesn't move the, uh, it doesn't move your user's awareness forward. They, they, will, they will have to rely on the press to get that information and the press may or may not have it right, but if they don't have an authorita authoritative response from the vendor, then you know, they don't, 
they, they have to rely on what they hear in the press. And unfortunately, the press doesn't have all the information all the time, and they're, coming, they're getting it from multiple places. Let's say there's three different security researchers who evaluated a, a problem and think of it all differently. Like the authoritative, authoritative response needs to come from the vendor, because the vendor probably has a little bit more insight into how something actually works, usually. Um, a lot of vendors don't want to give that information out because they feel like um, it opens them up. It, first of all, it creates a longer press cycle when it comes to the story about the vulnerability, and that's painful. For sure, and I understand why, why most companies don't want to tolerate that sort of thing. But on the upside, your users know what to expect. They know, oh, there's a, there's a, there's a fix coming. Great. And if actually you're good at shipping patches quickly, then it doesn't have to be this, this, uh, this painful thing. So you kind of have to approach it from both sides. So Mozilla actually has a security group about, um, of course, we're about 120 people now, but it's from all different parts of the community. It's um, uh, people who are paid to work on the Mozilla project by Mozilla Corporation. They're people who are paid to work on Mozilla code by other organizations. Like they're, it's just aligned with their uh, organization's goals to have someone working on some Firefox code, for example. Um, and there are also a lot of independent contributors, volunteers, college students, you name it. People who just really want to work on, on, on Firefox and people who, who are invested in it. Um, features are, are reviewed by uh, this, this group to make sure that it's, 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 in, it's aligned with our overall security goals and that it's designed with security in mind. One of the things that's really different in our security process is that we do security updates every six to eight weeks. Um, you might see security updates from other vendors, but what you see from them is uh, a, a, co a collection of vulnerabilities that have been identified in that product recently, and they're kind of fixing those particular uh, uh, vulnerabilities. This is a, a different approach in that we are continuously doing security work internally, and that security work is continuously made available through our security update mechanism. So when you see, like, you know, oh, there's 12 bugs fixed from Firefox, um, it does, it, it's not uh, comparable to, let's say, 12 bugs or three bugs fixed from another vendor because the, bu the bugs that they're fixing internally go into service packs or they go into major re re revisions. So one of the things, if I could change anything about the security industry or the software industry and how we all do uh, security work, it would be this, that, like, if you're going to do the security work, you don't necessarily have to wait to put it into a major update or into a, a, a version release or a major version release or a service pack. It's that, that work can be a benefit to your users now, and if it's, um, you shouldn't think of it as a, as a value add for the next version. It should be available right away. So that's one thing that we do really dif differently, is that we're doing security work continuously, and we're making it available continuously. It's not just rolled up in the next major version. So we've got some problems in the security industry in general, and that there's a real lack of metrics. It's really hard to figure out who's, who's doing a good job and who's not, and uh, how to compare one project to another or a project to itself over time. And, um, most vendors ship security updates for vulnerabilities reported externally, which is kind of what I was just talking about here. Like if it was reported, if it was reported externally, like a security researcher goes to a Microsoft, for example, and says, um, I found this vulnerability, and Microsoft says, oh, great, thanks, we'll, we'll, we'll fix, it, fix it in an update. And then eventually it comes out in a security update along with whatever came out in you know, a, a reasonable, a nearby time frame, and it'll end up in a security update. But the work that they did internally, and they hire, and they, they talk about this really publicly, they hire people to come in and do security consulting for them, find vulnerabilities. They have tools internally. They've got a, a lot of security education going into training their developers and testers to find security vulnerabilities. But then all that work goes up into the next service pack or it goes up into the next major release. So we don't see the benefit of that version for year, uh, of that work potentially for years. So um, there's good reasons to do this too. I'm not saying this is this is a broken model entirely. There are good reasons to do this, and one of those reasons is that um, the vulnerabilities, the, the fixes for those vulnerabilities, will get the benefit of a full test pass. And if you're a vendor like Microsoft, you've got 500 apps that are part of the AppCompat test suite, and like they'll want to make sure that, that they're not breaking functionality when they make a, a change. And it's good to get the benefit of all that work. Um, it, it, uh, it also means that there are, fewer, there are fewer updates that when an update does ship that there are fewer things that change, so the regression rate is lower. The number of things that will potentially break is going to be lower. We call that the regression rate. Um, so there, there are reasons that they do this, and it's, not, it's, not, it's, a, it's a reasonable choice for Microsoft, but I don't think it's the only way of doing things, and it's, 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 um, and it's, it's risky to do things uh, this other way, but it's, I think the, the benefit outweighs the cost, and that is to say, you also can't tell it from the outside how many bugs are fixed, so you can never compare, and I don't think you should. Um, you can never ca compare a number of bugs from one project to the next. It doesn't actually make a lot of sense because the way you count is actually quite different. So um, the reason I really want other vendors to move away from this model is because if you know, if you find a vulnerability and you're waiting for the vehicle for like a year to get into a service pack or multiple years to get into a major update, if it's a really complex 
uh, fix. If it required re-architecting a major component or something, it makes sense to not ship that in a security update. But a lot of things are just one-line fixes for buffer overflows or for integer overflows or implementation level vulnerabilities. And to, to keep users waiting for that fix when they could potentially be at risk from it is, uh, I don't think it's, 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 it's serving them the way, the way a security vendor really needs to, um, especially when you know about it. Um, because if you were able to find it, it means an attacker was able to find it too. Um, they're using all the same tools. They're, you know, we are not more clever than they are. <laughs> they are, they are um, very capable. So to assume that just because you haven't seen it in the wild that they haven't figured it out, it's a, it's a dangerous uh, assumption to make. So um, one of the things I try to encourage in the industry is for, you know, is for vendors to evaluate whether or not the benefit of this huge pass, test pass outweighs the benefit of getting the fix out earlier and um, see if they can change their overall policy for, for when they ship these things. It, it, the, one of the reasons they do this is because the press is really negative. When you, when, you, when, you, when you fix 12 vulnerabilities, the story is not about how, yeah, you fix these 12, 12 vulnerabilities and they're not gonna impact your users anymore. The story is about, oh no, Firefox had these 12 vulnerabilities. But that's the wrong story. The wrong story should be like, we're actively looking for security problems. There's vulnerabilities in all software. We're, act we're actively looking for problems in software and so is Microsoft and so are you know, most, of these, most of these software vendors. Um, we're, we're making an effort to fix these things and improve the security, and this is the evidence. This is the output of our work. So it should be evaluated as a, uh, an improvement and not as, um, a, as simply a problem. And by going through, I'll, I'll get it right to you. By going through the process this way, we're encouraging them to bundle uh, fixes together so that you don't really know what happened or how many bugs were contained in the patch so you don't really understand the problem completely. Um, sometimes if it goes into a service pack or a major revision, the user end up having to pay to get that next level of security, even though it's for a problem that could have been easily fixed in the previous version. But they don't want to have to fix it in the previous version because they might then be forced to uh, fix it in every version, including versions that are out of, out of support and so on. There's liability issues that they're concerned about there that haven't been tested. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and we are potentially exposed if, we're, if we are, if we, if, if, if we were able to find these as security uh, testers in this organization, then it's likely that an attacker would be able to find them as well. Yes? Do you think it's the same thing that the code of press regarding vulnerability fixes would go a long way towards changing how companies do that? I mean, how much do you think that is an effect on the way companies respond? I think it would, and I think it has. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples here. Um, so. Microsoft didn't want to talk about anything when I got there, and I spent a lot of time at Microsoft trying to get them to be more open about these sorts of things. And they're a lot more open now about what they're talking about. Um, uh, like the, uh, the, one of the things I really wanted to change about how the security industry thinks about security or how to, how to measure security is that well, we're, we're, security metrics are, 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 are uh, minimal at best. Um, so one of the things that people rely on, because it's easy to understand, is counting bugs. Like, oh, Firefox fixed this many bugs that year, or so Firefox had this many bugs this year, and IE had that many bugs this year, and therefore, uh, the one with the less is the more secure. And that's broken for a lot of reasons. Um, is that my next slide, actually? Nope. It's broken for a lot of reasons. Um, and the first of this is that the number of bugs that you find is related to how hard you're looking, how good you are at looking, and how many bugs were there maybe. Um, uh, so when, when we step up our processes and do more penetration testing, when we go out to the community and say, hey, spend more time looking for vulnerabilities in Firefox or in you know, any software. This, this relates to like any software project. If you spend more time looking, you're going to find more because they are there. Um, and uh, uh, so if you find more and you fix more, you, you, this is actually a success because your investigation uh, methods and your tools and your techniques and your, 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 your testers are demonstrating their, their excellence by finding so many bugs. Um, and you're uh, demonstrating um, uh, capacity for for for, uh, for your, uh, your fixed processes are, are are effective as well. So it's 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 wrong to encourage the press the, for the the press to encourage vendors to do something other than improve security, which is what they're doing when they um, when they when they create an environment where people don't want to say how many bugs that they found or how many bugs that they fixed. Do you think that's an education situation where the press needs to be educated about the nature of computer software? So that's part of it, and then also I, I'll give back to you guys. We need better security metrics, and I spend a lot of time thinking about security metrics so that we can measure something else. Because like the, they're measuring bugs because they have very little else to measure. So if you give them something else to measure, then um, that that's that's more that 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 actually gives you a, a better idea of whether or not a a project is either uh, improving over time or it compares to one another. You know, code complexity, things like that. If you work on uh, developing better metrics, then we'll have a better story, and we can get them away from counting bugs. They count bugs because it's easy, um, and because there's nothing else. And I think actually that's changing. I really think that they're moving more to days of risk, and I'll talk about that a little bit less, or a little bit more in a second. Um, 
again, vacuum of, of, of metrics here in, uh, in computer security. And you have these questions, it's not just managers, it's, it's customers, but the question about should I be worried is, 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 it comes up all the time. And like the question is really how worried and um, is it better? Um, how do we prioritize and when are we gonna get there, wherever there is? Um, how do you think about those things if you don't have any real metrics? Well, we, uh, we wanna make sure that we are using metrics that promote doing things the right way. So counting bugs promotes doing things the wrong way. That's like, it, it, if you don't hire more penetration testers, you won't find more bugs. So it like, it, it <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you send Jesse on vacation, Jesse's one of our big bug finders, if you send him on vacation, your bug, fi your bug find uh, rate goes way down. So you look like you're doing fabulously. Like, wow, things must be really secure now. It didn't get more secure, you just stopped looking, or you're not looking at them in the same way. So um, we don't want to incent, we don't want to incent um, uh, vendors to do that, and that's currently the situation. So these are some really high-level metrics that we use, um, and, and I'll go through all of these, but there are a lot of, we're actually doing a lot of metrics work right now because we want to make sure that um, we have ways to evaluate whether or not we're successful, whether our tools are successful, whether our processes are successful, and then we also want to make that available to the rest of the software development community because we want people to be able to uh, think about security differently than they have been. So. Um, the first thing is severity, and that's, that's, that's been in, in, in play for a while, though it's not consistent um, across multiple projects in the industry. CERT has, like, I guess, their own, their own evaluation, but it doesn't match up well with Microsoft's, and it doesn't match up well with, with Mozilla's, and so you've got this gap of severity um, um, all over the place. But severity, at least, you can use to measure, you can, you can track it across the same project over time as long as they don't change um, what they think of as you know, a critical bug versus what they think of as a low severity bug. But, um, so we try and keep that consistent within our own project. Um, and it's important because it helps us to figure out what to fix first. So it's important to identify whether, you know, what the level of severity is. And we'd like to fix everything, but uh, some things get uh, more attention first, and we, we prioritize based on severity. And I'm not gonna go in through in detail the, the severity ratings, but the, uh, the high end is, the, the critical end is if it allows uh, uh, someone to take over your machine from remote, just doing the things that you normally do when you're browsing, then we'll call it a critical. And on the low end, we've got things like uh, minor data leaks and, and spoofing and things that just, you know, they almost have no security risk associated with them, but they're still kind of a security issue, and if we have a chance to fix it, we will. I've also seen low, secu low severity security bugs. Um, if you stack a handful of them up, you might end up with a real security vulnerability, like a critical security, they're all real. You might end up with a critical se security scenario. So an example of this is um, we had a couple of low se se severity vulnerabilities, one which included you are able to write a file to disk. It's like, well, Okay, you can write a file to disk, but you can't overwrite an existing file, so you can't compromise data that's already there. You can't necessarily read it back. Nah. Okay, so that's, that's low severity. You can write the file. Maybe you could download service the disk by you know, writing 80 gigs of I don't know what, maybe. It's, it's, it's kind of hard to come up with a real scenario for how this is gonna hurt users, so it's a low severity um, security issue. Another one was given a file, you could get back the full path. It's like, okay, well, what do you do with that? That's not that interesting. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a data leak. It's you know, that's information that probably shouldn't be coming back to the, to the, uh, to the, the website that initiated it. Um, you know, or potentially the attacker. But you know, what can you really do with that? I don't know, that's, that's not that interesting. So it's a low severity uh, vulnerability. And uh, you know, the last of these was one that allowed you to execute a binary that existed on the system, the file system. Which is like, okay, well if the binary exists on the file system, it was probably part of the operating system or part of applications that they installed, or it's, it's already on their system, so you know, that's, a, that's a low severity vulnerability because you can't really do much about that by itself. But if you stack these all together, you end up with a critical scenario because an attacker can drop the file on your system, figure out where it went, um, and then execute it. And so now you're executing arbitrary code, which adds it to a critical scenario. So it's important not to ignore these low severity vulnerabilities because they, they can add up. And I think one of the things that the industry is inclined to do is to uh, artificially lower the severity of these vulnerabilities. And then if they're low enough, you can pump them and say like, well, we set the bar at moderate, we're not fixing those things. And um, we're not gonna worry about them. But if you, if you don't keep them on your task list, you will never know when the critical scenario developed because you've punted all the low severity vulnerabilities. And I definitely see vendors that punt uh, low. Actually, they almost all do. So, uh, find rate. One of the things that we're talking about is uh, you know, how many bugs have we found? I'm like, this is still counting bugs, but um, we need to know, this is helpful for us to evaluate whether or not our, our tools are effective. So, did it find bugs? Like, were those bugs, what were the severities of those bugs? Um, and um, are we finding more now, or, or um, is it starting to taper off? So, if we're, if we're using a, a fuzzing tool, which is a tool that throws a lot of data at an application, and tries to figure out uh, how it handles unexpected data. If uh, that tool was effective at finding bugs initially, and we fixed a bunch of things, and now it's not finding so many, 
then you know the find rate helps us figure out the, the effectiveness is de is decreasing on that tool. So um, for some methods, people keep asking us about like uh, source code analysis, you know, static source code analysis. It's hard for us to justify a lot of spending a lot of time in source code analysis, and one of the reasons we can uh, demonstrate that this isn't necessarily the best investment for our time is because we've got this uh, this find rate that we looked at. We found it, found, it flagged 300 vulnerabilities, and they released a press release about how it flagged 300 uh, red flags in, uh, in 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 Firefox, which are these are code constructs that may or may not result in actual vulnerabilities, but these constructs are, are dangerous, so they're it's worth flagging. And I understand why the source code analysis tool looks for that, but when you go through these actual constructs and you look for real vulnerabilities in the set of 300, we found zero. So the output was. Uh, pretty much useless to us, even though you know it looks initially like it finds something interesting, but in reality, none of those constructs ended up being real vulnerabilities, so we can go ahead and say, this tool is not very effective for us, and it's not worth spending our time. So when people keep asking us, like, why don't you spend more time doing source code analysis, I can say, well, this is what all the fuzzing tools find us, and if we, buy, if we write more fuzzing tools, or if we engage vendors that do um, uh, uh, more of this di dynamic you know, analysis, uh, this is our output. When we do source code analysis, this is our output. This isn't where we want to spend our time. But if you want to, because it's a community project, it's source code, it's open, you know, if you want to do it, fabulous, go nuts. And a fix rate, this is kind of a painful, painful one for us. It's like once you know about the vulnerability, um, you have to get a fix. And uh, how, how, you're, how quickly you're able to fix the, the vulnerability is uh, going to be uh, a, key, a key factor in how, uh, how long your, your users are at risk. Because the, the overall window of opportunity is made up of not just the, the fix rate, but also um, how long it takes for the fix to be deployed. So, because the attacker doesn't care whether or not the user is vulnerable because the fix doesn't exist or if the fix isn't installed, the, the user's still vulnerable. So we're still looking at the overall window of risk. But the first part of that is the fix rate. So we're looking at things like how long does it take to fix the bug? Um, how many are we, are we knocking it out? Is our, is our backlog growing? If we're finding more than we're fixing, um, do we have a growing backlog? And when will we ever catch up? Um, probably need to devote more, more resources to, find, to, to fixing if, if, if that's the case. Um, and then, of course, regressions. Like for any number of bugs that we fix, what, what sort of regression rate are we looking at? If we're looking at a regression rate, I've worked on a project before that had a regression rate of close to 25%. So for every bug, every, every four bugs you fix, one of them would regress and create another bug you had to fix. That's insane. That is like, that, that, that's, so now, now you're using that piece of information to justify, well, um, this low severity bug, you know, or these four low severity bugs, if I fix one of them, one of them's gonna regress. Like it's, it's, easier, it's easier for that team to then justify saying, well, we're gonna punt on these low severity bugs because the regression rate is so high, this code is so fragile, we're just not gonna do it. But tracking that for, for individual piece, parts, of, um, parts of your code base is important because it helps you figure out whether um, it's, it, it's worth it to invest in fixing some of these lower, lower severity um, bug rates. But it also helps you figure out which, bugs, which, which components have the highest concentration of bugs. So we like to think of certain parts of the code as bug rich. <laughs> Um, if you're going looking for bugs, you're going to find more bugs in, in these parts of the code because it's uh, maybe it's doing a lot of processing or um, uh, a lot of input validation, for for example. So if you're, you're doing threat modeling on this, you're trying to figure out like where you, spend, you should spend your time. Like, that's that's really helpful to to incorporate that piece of knowledge. So as I was talking about, the overall window of risk is how long does it take to get it fixed, and then the last part of this is how long does it get take to get the the patch deployed. Um, the the, the Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about like how, how we work and how, what, you know, what I think the, the rest of the software development world can, can take away from what Mozilla is doing here. One of the reasons that we're actually able to ship fixes really quickly, and compared to the rest of the industry, we're actually very fast. We're one of, the most, one of the fastest software vendors in terms of getting fixes turned around once, they've been, once a security vulnerability has been identified. And one of the reasons for this is that we've got all these people downloading our nightly builds. And these are our testers, and they, 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 they test to make sure, like, if we had, even if we had infinite resources, it would be incredibly difficult to set up 20,000 different um, workstations with 20,000 different users visiting 20,000 different sets of websites and having 20,000 different web experiences on a particular night and seeing if the change that we made impacted that experience. Yeah? Is any of that testing automated? There is automated testing. This is the, what I'm talking about here is, is, is manual. And like, because because the, the, uh, the point I'm trying to make is that we are able to get a broad, really broad uh, testing on um, on these fixes. So we're able to get, so our, our test pass is shorter and we're able to get these fixes out quicker. Um, that's hard for, harder for other teams to emulate, but um, there, are other, there are other components in, in terms of automated testing that, like, that, that enable them to, to get fixes out quicker. Um, but, the, but the benefit of having done that is that the, the window of risk is significantly smaller. And these are not just developers, these are like you know, anybody, this, this is like, you know, uh, anyone can download and run it and if they see a problem they can say what, what you know, they can report the problem that they saw. Time to deploy is the, is the amount of time that from when the fix has been, has been uh, posted and when the user gets it installed. So uh, 
this is actually kind of a tricky one. We don't get metrics for this from any other vendors. We're, as far as I know, Mozilla is the only one who shares this information. Um, we're measuring this uh, via AUS pings, which are um, automatic update service pings. So basically, Firefox, when you start it up, says, you know, um, hi, I'm version, you know, 303. Is there something new for me? And um, uh, if there is, it'll, it'll download the, the update. So that's how we, that's basically the only piece of information that we track. And when we see that, we were able to say, okay, well, this percentage of users were on this version because, you know, we're getting this many requests a day and, and now X percent has moved over to the, net, to the next side. Um, so this is, this is what it looked like about uh, two years ago. We saw it took about eight days to, to move from, um, from, the, uh, from, from version 1506 to 1507. And at about uh, day three, we actually had more users on the, on the current version. And after about eight days, 90% of the population was, was, was migrated over to the, to the most recent security update. And then we saw um, all the way, when we moved to, uh, to 204, it took, uh, it took only six days to get to 90% um, uh, of our users on the most recent platform. We're actually seeing it continue to go down. But that means that we can say with a, with a reasonable amount of confidence that most of our users are on the uh, you know, are on the most uh, re frequent update within, so we can certainly say a week, right? They're like 90% of our users are within a week on the newest version of the, of, of the, of the, of the, um, of the browser, which means that we can evaluate how long we have to keep information about the vulnerability secret until we can make it available for, the, for our community. Because if users aren't, um, they're, if they're not vulnerable anymore, um, then there's, there's no problem really in making that information available. So, um, this is one of the things that you guys can do, like as individuals, is to, is to ask questions of, about our vendors and uh, things like when, when you guys blog, it makes a difference. They hear this stuff. When you guys, um, as a it, you know the IT organization here, when you um, make choices as a as a as a as a consumer of their products, all these things really change how they think about um, vulnerabilities. So if you ask them for this information, and they hear it from other customers, and they hear it from the blogosphere, and they hear it uh, from the security research community. Um, it changes what, what they do over time, and it's really had a real effect. The XPSP2, um, Microsoft uh, started going down the path of XPSP2 because they were feeling customer pain, that the customers were saying these kinds of things, that the world was, that the, you know, the, the reporters, the, uh, the, the, the people who were using their products were like, you know, saying, like, this is crazy, I, I've got to move someplace else because I, I don't feel like I understand what you're doing about security or when, when this problem is going to end. Um, so th that really did drive what, what happened at Microsoft and how they, they changed their, their mind about security and, and, and they changed their investment in security. So um, I do want to talk about security UI because I think that's one of the most impo important places for the inter industry to innovate in security. I mean, you can have all these fantastic uh, uh, inventions in security to you know do you know uh, multi-factor authentication and whatever. If the UI is not there, then people are going to. If it's not easy to use, if it doesn't help users understand what they're what they're trying to accomplish, then they're going to go around it. Um, and uh, and this isn't because they're dumb. And I think I can run into a lot of reporters who want me to say that users are dumb because I keep like trying to ask that question. It's like you know, oh, users are too dumb to understand this 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 warning that you hear up there. Like users aren't dumb. They're trying to get something accomplished, and your UI is in the way. <laughs> and um, the uh, like, I, I even do it. I, I will I will acknowledge them. Like, yep, I see that, but I'm trying to do something else over here. And so, you know, like, um, uh, I need to walk my dog. My neighborhood's a little sketchy, but uh, it's 11 o'clock. My dog says. It's time to go out. I'm going out. You know, like that's that's uh, you know you just you just you you manage your risk the best you can. But when it comes down to it, you're gonna have to get a, 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 a task accomplished. So I think we can do a lot better. So one of the things that we're trying to do is to uh, avoid ambiguity. We've uh, we've got a lot of signals going on in the security space uh, or in the in, in terms of security UI that have been overloaded. One of my favorites is the uh, little lock at the bottom of the web browser that says that it's, it's intended to communicate that SSL is present, that, that this connection is protected through SSL. Um, but it has been interpreted at, by users by, you know, to mean all kinds of things, including this website is secure, or uh, this transaction is, is or, or like this, this transaction is going to the right place, or it, it, isn't, it doesn't mean those things. It's only saying something about the, 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 the connection itself. And uh, that's unfortunate, it's overloaded. So one of the things that we're trying to do is move UI in a direction that avoids ambiguity. So we're trying to be very precise, or as precise as we can with, Im with images, because that's, for the most part, what we're using. Um, it's, it's, it's tempting as an uh, engineer to develop things that are cool <laughs> and that are fun, that, are, uh, that, that might be used by somebody sometime. And I think that's, that's fine in, in some cases. But in terms of security, you need to focus on what matters to users. Like, computers have, uh, you know, we, we we, uh, we can do different things when we're considering you know, how, com how computers communicate to each other um, security information. But users um, 
have a really hard time with lots of passwords and long passphrases and um, you know, requiring a one and a capital letter and a character in their password, which may or may not you know, lower the, uh, the, uh, the overall security of the password by reducing the, the key space anyway, or the, the, password, the space for the, key, for the password to exist in any way. Um, but focusing on what the user, the user experience is something that um, I think from a security perspective has not been the focus in general. So we're trying to move it in that direction. Um, one of the things that we have seen in general, and a couple, couple of studies on this, that like the lock present either in the location bar or um, in, as part of the Chrome at the bottom that indicates that the SSL is present um, means exactly the same thing to the vast majority of users as a lock that's in the web page content that um, that's actually just part part of the web page. And uh, for for those of you who aren't familiar, the difference between like the the UI uh, of, of Firefox versus the content, the content in the web page is controlled by the website, um, and you know. We can overlay things over, but in general, it's just what the web website presents, we, we, we present in a, in a predictable way. But what happens in the Chrome is supposed to be only managed by Firefox, but users don't have um, this, this, this uh, uh, differentiator uh, for the most part between what happens in the Chrome and what happens in the content. So if someone puts up a picture of a lock, then they think it's secure too. Um, not everybody, but for the most part, that's, that's the impression you get. So let's not, let's not try and generate trust around indicators that, that can be subverted easily. Um, another of these is we, we kind of expect our users to, 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 to notice when the lock's not there. That's not very useful. Like, like when, things, when bad things are about to happen, we should tell users. They should not have to look and see, did, did someone, is, is, is there a, a, is someone telling me that things are safe? You know, like things should be safe otherwise, unless they're, unless they're not. Um, so one of the ways that we're trying to change this is through um, our, our any, any phishing and any malware protection where we, um, we, we change the UI pretty dramatically. If you run into a site that's, that's uh, been identified as either containing a phishing site or, or potentially malware on it, um, because uh, saying everything's good is, is, not, um, is not as useful as, as, as letting people know when something bad happened or is about to happen. And this has kind of been a difficult one for us. Sometimes you actually do have to make the call. And one of the things that we've started doing is saying that when the only decision when the decision that you're asking the user to make is uh, going to lead to something really bad, and most users are, don't want that bad thing to happen, so for us, that 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 this uh, this scenario breaking instance was, um, we've identified that this site that you're trying to visit has malware on it, and we throw up the UI saying really bad things are about to happen. Do we give them a nah? That's okay. I'm trying to do something. Let you know. Let me, let me click through this and go ahead. Um, or do we do we just stop the user and make the call for them? Um, and we made the call. We said, you know what? There doesn't need to be a click through on malware. Who wants malware installed on their machine? There's like there are very few scenarios where that makes sense for a user to continue through. Um, and there are scenarios. There's a, there's a security researcher who's doing malware um, analysis who really you know is, is, is operating in a virtual machine and you know wants to test this 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 malware and see what happens when when they visit this page. But that's a very small percentage of the overall population. I think we can go ahead and make the call for the rest of the population and say like, no, actually, I don't think you wanted that malware installed on your machine, and so we're just gonna block it and give you some information about what happened. But you no, know, you need to go uh, do something else now. Um, if you if you if you want to change it, of course, you can go in, into preferences and get pretty deep in there and turn off any malware protection. But the very few users are going to. We don't need to give them a click through because you know they, again, back to the the, the, uh, the original statement about um, users. They're not dumb. They're just trying to accomplish a task, and you need to throw up a barrier that they're not going to circumvent because uh, it's important enough in this case. Um, and that was a painful thing for us because we were also worried about you know like what what happens if we start blocking sites that are legitimate you know is there a liability issue for this for us there is it going to make people feel like there's less if there are false positives that, that uh, this mechanism is not useful for and they should turn it off so um, these are the, the decisions that we're, we're working through in, in security wide and this is not specific to just Firefox this is the, this is this is a, an industry wide problem and I think we're getting better in general as an industry at communicating with our users but uh, not good enough for the important communications that we the important information that we are trying to communicate. So um, we try and, cons and consider what are the key tasks for security and how can we get our community to help us with those efforts. And um, so one of the things that we, we wanted to do is with the, with the applying an update, the, uh, getting, the, getting the fix out there, like I said, was only part of the problem in terms of reducing the overall risk. Some of the rest of this is, uh, is, is the last part of it. So one of the features that we incorporated is Session Restore. If you are shopping online, you've got like five browser tabs open looking at different, I don't know, cars. So you're, looking, you're shopping for cars, you've got all these different comparison sites open, and you've got um, all this information that you're doing, you're presented with a dialogue that says a security update is available. Now before, people would you know, be like, oh, well, I'm in the middle of something, I'll, I'll do it later. 
um, it's, it, it's, it's, it's bothering them. Um, but if you know that if you click accept and Firefox will restart in a couple of seconds and everything that you were just doing was right back where you left it, you're more inclined to go ahead and accept that update when it comes out. And I think that was one of the reasons for the major um, uh, uh, decrease in the window for time to deploy from the time that um, uh, the, the 1.5 uh, time frame to the 2.0 time frame is the session restore mechanism. That it doesn't look like a security mechanism, it looks like a uh, security feature, it looks like a functionality feature. But in reality, because it's reducing the, the, the window of, of risk, it, it really is a security feature because it lets people accept the update and get back to what they were doing. So thinking about security features that don't look like security features or tr traditional security features, I think as, a, as an industry is something that we need to do. And one of those, one of those categories, broad categories, is um, making security easier and letting people get back to work or back to the tasks they have on hand. Um, so this is what the, uh, the, the, the any phishing um, uh, error looks like. You've, you've you stumbled across and then it looks like a, a, a phishing site. And um, it, it lets you report that you're, if your experience is incorrect, like this is not a, a phishing site, it lets you report back so you've got that information available to you. Um, or if you want to report a, a one that you got an email but you didn't visit in your web browser, you can report that so that it, it ends up um, in the database and helping protect other users. So we're leveraging the community to help protect other users. And those are all validated by, by uh, humans for the most part, so uh, you're able to, to tell whether or not somebody has, uh, has just you know, tried to, I don't know, sink Amazon by reporting it as a, as a, as a phishing site. So that, you know, that, that, that vector is, uh, for the most part, um, not something that we're worried about right now. Um, <coughs> I think that, uh, like I said, there are lots of reasons that, these are, that, are, that vendors don't want to talk about security, um, most of which is like fear, and you know, we're, we're perpetuating that with the press. And if we, when uh, we see that there's lots of vulnerabilities out there, the more sensational story, that's the story that we're gonna go to. Um, and so um, we're encouraging that, but the, there, there are things we can do to counteract that. And in, encouraging uh, vendors to talk about security is uh, something that we, we, as an industry, need to contribute to. Um, so when you're, when you're uh, thinking about what sorts of projects, research projects, um, might be valuable to this industry, finding ways to congratulate uh, and measure and then congratulate vendors for doing reasonable things helps move the industry forward altogether because then uh, other vendors see that being open about security ends up contributing to um, uh, a public perception that they're doing reasonable things. So calling, so calling, calling it when they're doing bad things is important and we're all really good about doing that. Um, when someone's doing something unreasonable from a security perspective, you know, the industry will jump up and down all over them. But calling it when someone's doing something really productive is also important too because it encourages them to, to keep uh, to keep to keep sharing, and they do listen to us. Uh, we uh, we really, as users and as as, as a community, we're the ones that were uh, the change behind XPSP2. It was because customers said that they really need to do that, and the Microsoft has really changed not just how Microsoft operates, and of course that impacts like you know hundreds of millions of, of users, but it also ends up changing how other vendors view security and whether or not they're, when they measure themselves up against the industry standard, there's a new standard to measure themselves against. So it ends up having a tremendous impact, even if you are able to influence just like one vendor through a research project or through, um, you know, your blog as, 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 as a consumer. So, any questions? It is Bugzilla. It's a Mozilla. Bugzilla is actually a Mozilla product, project. And that works well. It works well enough. <laughs> um, my other question is, um, and I don't expect you to have a fountain of advice for this, but uh, most of the companies I've worked for in software projects have had security as a high priority. So given a scenario where one is working on a large, complex legacy code base, where you're funded basically um, from the National Institute of Health and the National Cancer Institute, which means you don't have a lot of money, barely have enough money to fix the non-security bugs to make the thing work in the first place and you can't hire any new people, yet you're concerned about security. How would, how would a sane person proceed in, in that scenario? That's really tough. And I'll tell you what people have done in the past. I'm not saying this is necessarily the best approach, but in the past, if you wanted to get funding in your organization for um, security work, you demonstrated the vulnerability in the in the project in, in the product or the system or, or what have you. It's effective. It's not nice, but it's effective. Um, and it, there's you know potentially some political capital that you're going to lose there, um, but it, it will work. Um, and like you know that's, that's that's this is actually the debate between full disclosure and 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 um, and uh, you know, responsible disclosure. Um, and I, I think actually 
all the parties are, 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 are probably think that they're being responsible in their own way, which is why I put quotes around responsible disclosure. But let's just go with that. Full disclosure as an ideology was there because, uh, is, is based because on the idea that once upon a time, if you didn't throw these things out in the public and shame the vendors into fixing things, they wouldn't do it. And they, you know, the research world, security research world did that because they had to, because vendors wouldn't fix anything. If you told them about the vulnerability, they'd be like, this is theoretical, I don't think this is a real issue, it's not impacting our users, or thanks very much, and then they wouldn't talk to you at all. Um, so there's a reason that full disclosure exists. I don't know that for most vendors it's required for today to do that sort of thing, but it, it was very effective back then. Today, um, a lot of vendors will take a security report m much more seriously than they, 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 they did in the past. And a lot more vendors will, will incorporate the, the, security, the person who reported the issue into the overall process. So you get some insight into what's going on so you actually see progress being made, and eventually, hopefully, you see a security fix. But internally, in an organization, you, know, you can do threat modeling. You can identify other projects that have had, that are similar projects that have had security vulnerabilities and what it actually cost them. But also, as a, as a, as a, as a uh, engineer or as, a, as somebody who wants to call attention to this, you also have to balance the business the business cost, right? It might, what, what they're doing might be sufficient, even if what they're doing is insecure. Um, so, I, like they, I, I would try and figure out whether or not they are tolerating the risk, um, because they, they 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 know what the risk is, that they don't have the resources for it, and they they understand what the comp, what the consequences will be, or if they just don't know about it and they haven't made an educated decision about this because it hasn't come up. Um, but if they've if they've got no resources. And there are no people to throw at this, and um, it hasn't come. It hasn't. They haven't felt pain around it yet. It's going to be difficult to change their mind until they, they feel pain about it. And I don't necessarily want to promote the idea of showing them pain, which is the full disclosure um, attitude about this. It's not. The, that's not the entire story around full disclosure. I don't want to simplify it to just those those details. But you know, for, that, for, the, for the most part, that's why it it, it came about. Um, it's effective, but it's not nice. And um, and there's going to be a window of risk for the user that once like this information is available. Um, that the, the, the risk goes up and it's going to take, especially a company that's not used to a security response, it's going to take them a long time to fix that um, compared to how long the attacker is going to have to, to make use of it and, and, and compromise users especially. So I would say finding uh, similar projects and uh, similar problems that they've faced and then also being conscious of the fact that they may be tolerating this risk because that's what's appropriate for their environment. Mobile, definitely. Mobile, absolutely. Security is going to be. We have. We, we're taking um, a bunch of scenarios that we understand for the most part on the PC, and we're throwing them into a whole other place. Um, and and, and uh, the, the 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 game really changes in mobile in, in mobile browsing because you don't have the same mechanisms to rely on in the operating system that you do uh, for a web browser on a PC. So it's 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 it's. Uh, this happens every time you take te technology and you move it from the place where it was developed, you move it someplace else, and you don't understand uh, all the how the context really changed. And uh, the, the browser or the piece of software that you've moved into the space is getting new inputs from places that it's not expecting. Things that they thought of as, 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 as either secure or, or trustworthy uh, input, like inputs are, are now coming from places that they, they don't expect. I think it's really going to change. Uh, pretty significantly. So, like doing mobile banking when you can't, when you don't have secure storage on your phone, it's uh, that's that's a dangerous thing. Or um, there's no compartmentalization between uh, kernel mode and, and and user mode because there is there's only one mode in a lot of these um, mobile operating systems. That's going to change things because you know for the most part we as application developers are used to having separation between um, uh, you know kernel space and your, your application application user space. I'm wondering if you see that maybe catalyzing a change in security focus since the OS will be hosted on web accessible servers at Microsoft. I wonder if that will change the global interpretation of security. I think things are changing anyway because all of our scenarios are moving online. Instead of, like, for the most part, uh, using uh, a, a mail client that's on your PC and your mail is stored on your PC, uh, for the most part, we're all using uh, web mail where you can access your mail from anywhere. And even if you're using a client, you know, you still have your mail stored maybe in the cloud somewhere and you're accessing it from remote and, and uh, you know, you've got your photos instead of stored locally and managed locally. You might have them stored at Flickr or, you know, Shutter, whatever. Uh, you know, there's, there's the, the, we've already moved all of the functions of um, 
of, of the operating system for home users anyway, and it's moved in that direction for, for enterprise users as well. We get things to like salesforce.com and you know, these other providers that are providing uh, cloud computing. It's, it's changing anyway, so moving the operating system to the web, I don't, I don't know how much that specifically is, is changing the scenario. I think that the whole, that, that whole space is moving that way anyway, and that's creating a whole other set of uh, security vulnerabilities because we're taking scenarios from the context in which they were developed and moving them into um, a whole other context, and that creates, that creates uh, all kinds of vulnerabilities that we, we are threats that we wouldn't have uh, expected, and we're, we're going to be surprised by them, and we're always surprised by them every single time it happens. We see the same categories of vulnerabilities appear in web applications that we used to see in client server applications in the mid-90s before we even had buffer overflows available to us in terms of things to take over, and we see them again. They, they, they happen again in like 2005, 2008, and I'm just like, wait a minute. I, I remember this for sure. I, we definitely had this happen before, and it's just uh, it's because it's a new context and people aren't thinking about it the same way. where you can task a set of people to work on this project. You sort of, have, so what kind of mechanisms do you use to motivate this volunteer army out there to, to spend time paying attention to this issue that you actually think has a, should have a higher priority than to these other issues that people seem to want to spend their time doing? That's a great question, and it's actually incredibly difficult, um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, marginal success with that. So it's, it's difficult to... Um, to influence that authority, which is kind of what we're working with here. There's no authority here. Like I, like I might have a title, but I don't have any authority to go say this is what you should work on. Uh, that doesn't happen. Like and I've, I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out like how do I get people to focus on the, on the, on, on security bugs and, and, and bringing down the security bug backlog. Um, and it's a, it's a hard thing because it's not fun. Um, and there's other things that are way more interesting and shiny and whirly over here that you know developers would rather work on. Um, so how do you how do you encourage people to do that? Um, one of the things I've been doing with security researchers is that in that community. Um, Demonstrating how it's how it's uh, it's good for them and good for the web and, and easy and easy to get easy to participate and, and uh, how valued their contribution is. Um, so these are these are just volunteers in the security research world and that's um, I think demonstrating for, to them how it's how it's useful to their objectives, how it moves forward things that they wanted to, um, or how it's related to research they've been doing. Um, that's been one of the things that um, I've uh, I found most, most success in in terms of the security research space. But you're right, it's incredibly difficult. Um, um, at Microsoft, uh, when I was a when I was the uh, security sign off for for XPSP2, um, so there's there's a, a, a an opera home, a meeting called the Windows Status Meeting externally. Internally, it's called Windows War, and it is war. You've got all these uh, pr project leads from different parts of the uh, of, of, of of the operating system in there. So there's somebody there who's who's looking out for performance. Someone there who is there for the IE team. Someone from networking. Somebody from localization, and someone from like partners, and you know all these people. Are, are dealing like every day, twice a day, with every issue that comes up across Windows because it impacts all of all these different all these different teams need to know what's going on at every other team. Now, um, there, there there was at that point, you know, a, a, a little bit more interest in security and like the recognition that it was required. But it's not like these were people. These people certainly didn't report to me. These are these are my peers in the in space. They were all we were all responsible for our individual components and um, developing uh, mechanisms for trying to convince people. Okay, like this is if so um, uh, developing uh, say a relationship with app compatibility. Say like um, if we. Uh, we need to do this. This is going to be dangerous, but what, what what needs to happen here so that AppCompat can be comfortable with it, so that AppCompat can sign off on this? They say, okay, well, you need to run these tests, and um, when if it passes all these tests cleanly, we can support that because that's you know it's aligned with our goals. It doesn't impact what we're doing, so so you guys can go ahead with that. And then you know the team that's that that, that owns the component that the, the the vulnerability or the 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 change is in or the design change is in. They uh, you know there are other ways to get them on board with things. So like finding. Um, uh, allies in that space and, and approaching them individually and then when you need to move something within the whole project, d do it in force with, with, with your allies so that it's not just security says we need to do this. It's kind of like security says we need to do this and, and AppCompat is 100% behind it and networking thinks that it's going to be a great improvement and might impact performance and you know it positively and, and so on. So I think that developing a, a coalition is uh, the only real way to get anything done when you have to, when you have to operate with influence and not authority. It's the same. Is, is it the same thing? It's the same in, in the open source. It's the same in every uh, in every 
I'd say even internationally in, in terms of you know, international foreign policy, I think it's 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 still it's true in every uh, uh, organization of peers where there's you know you're you're trying to move a group in a certain direction. You need to develop support for that idea within the group and then um, uh, use that momentum from you know the people that you have managed to move in that direction to move everybody else and influence the rest of the the, uh, the group. Um, what are we using? We do actually. I, 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 I'm kind of blanking on that. I will get back to you on that one. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, let's thank.